Next week we'll conclude our work on the consideration for deacons, and then you'll have some choices to make, but we'll talk about that more at the end of the lesson next week. But this week we're going to continue our journey through our consideration of deacons. <clears throat> I ask you to turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy 3 will be passages that we'll walk through this morning. They're really not comparative passages. Uh, there are things that are part of 1 Timothy 3 that have nothing to do with how things take place in Acts chapter 6. But Acts chapter 6 does give us some, some help with a few things to help us understand uh, how we can go about implementing some things in, Acts, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The real basis of Acts chapter 6 is found in verse 3. Because you have in verse 1 these Hellenistic widows. They would have been Jews who would have been people who spoke Greek, not Hebrew, and could not trace their lineage back to Abraham, who also would have begun to engage in the, the social life or the economy or life among the Grecians as opposed to among the Jews. So it's obvious in verse 1 that the Jewish widows are being taken care of. But the complaint comes that those among the Hellenistic or Grecian widows are being neglected. I've read numbers somewhere, and it's a vast, vast gap, I realize. Anywhere from five to 25,000 people might have been present at this time. I think 5,000, you have men, possibly. Then you number that with women and children, and it does kind of go up exponentially rather quickly. But you can tell this is a rather large crowd of people that have been multiplying ever since Acts chapter 2 has been, had been teaching and being engaged in. So there's a problem that arises, and the apostles say it's not right for us to leave the serving, serving of tables. They're serving, but they're <laughs> the serving of tables because they're serving the word. And so then he says, verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom you may appoint over this business. But, we'll continue, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. First question is, is there anything that is significant about the number seven? And what I would suggest about that is, is that the number of men selected depend upon the amount of work to be done. Obviously, seven men aren't going to take care of the number of people we just mentioned. But seven was also one of those numbers in Jewish life that was complete. And so it may stand for a complete group of men. And you have seven men that are listed. So seven is not something that says, okay, we have to have seven, and that's the scriptural number of deacons that you have. First of all, remember, we talked about last week, that the job description we must understand first. It's not that, okay, we just have to have deacons because we need, we need some uh, fill-ins on our letterhead. And we need some we can call officers so we can have our deacon officers, so we can look legitimate. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about servants. And we need to understand something about the job to be done, not necessarily the character of the man yet, but we need to understand something about the job to be done. And we don't understand the job, then we're not going to understand who we need to select to fulfill that job. And so you have the job here. And the job is there are some Grecian widows that are being neglected. And so they select seven Grecian men. These are Grecian names. And notice the compatibility that's there. And I think that suggests something to us. If there's a compatibility of individual or individual with individuals that, that can help, maybe race, maybe socioeconomic, maybe, maybe degree, whatever it might be, that there's some, some, some sort of companionship that can be that can be together, that it certainly helps if you have someone that, that can identify with the person that you're, you're dealing with. And so there are seven Grecian men that are chosen to serve seven or the, these number of Grecian widows that are being neglected. And so we begin to look at that then and we begin to see how these men then are described. And I would suggest something to you. Just like I reiterated time and again as we walk through the consideration of men who would serve as elders. If we didn't have this description that we're going to look at here and in 1 Timothy 3. But we have a problem choosing men to fit a job 
who fit the description and the character that we're going to talk about in these men? I don't think we'd have that problem. I think we'd understand that you want someone who's a good reputation. That is a rather broad term. That's a rather sweeping term. A good, rep- a good reputation, just a broadly a good reputation. Do you want someone who's got a reputation of ill repute? No, you want someone that has a good, broad reputation. And then someone full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Some clarification of what I understand that to be. I could be wrong. Full of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean ability to perform miracles. What they're simply saying is, I think, is you want spiritually minded men. You want men who are filled with the Spirit. They're filled with the Word. They're filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit, they're letting the Spirit direct and lead their God life. Would you want men that are carnally minded, who have no regard for spiritual things at all? No. So you want men who, who are filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 3, in the second prayer that Paul mentions there, beginning verse 14, he said, please fill us with your fullness, that we may be filled with the fullness of God. To be filled with the fullness of God means there's no room to put anything else in that bucket. And so if you're full of the Holy Spirit, you've got nothing else to be put in that bucket. Here's a person that is just full of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding them because that word is abiding in them and just pulsing in their heart, and the Spirit is leading and guiding their life, and they have a spiritual mind. And as a result of that, they have the wisdom of the Spirit. Again, you wouldn't want a novice. You want someone who has some experience with life and experience with knowledge. It's experience with the Bible. And so they choose these men. These are the kind of men, and that's a very narrow, very narrow description of the kind of men that the apostles tell these people, you choose these kind of men. And so Acts chapter 6 at least begins to point something to us, though it's not really comparative because, again, there are things in Acts 6 that are not part of 1 Timothy 3. In Acts 6, my understanding is, <coughs> pardon me, when the job was finished, their serving was finished because they were asked to serve for a particular reason and responsibility. So you consider that. So turn then to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll spend the balance of our time here in this text. First of all, in verse 8, he begins with this expression, likewise. Likewise what? He's just been talking for the first seven verses, as we have discussed, about the description of a man's character who would serve as a bishop, an elder, or a shepherd. And so he says, given that consideration, remembering that description of that man's character, deacons must be, and here you have the be again. These are men to be or must be. To be you have in the first part, they must be. Here are men who must be reverent. Does that mean he walks around with a scowl on his face, always a serious look of furrowed brow, and look how reverent I am, never laughs, never never has any fun, never enjoys life, never just tries to enjoy people and smile at people? No, that's not what reverent means. Remember, it doesn't mean that the person has no, no jocularity, no fun, no, no enjoyment about life. In fact, I would suggest the otherwise. I would suggest you have a person that's reverent. That person understands seriousness. And they understand to be serious when it's serious. But they also have fun when you have fun. I engaged in this March Madness stuff that's going on in a, this tournament that goes on around here. And the reason i got a scowl on my face is because I'm reverent. Because I'm in last place. That's not reverent, is it? But you can enjoy life. Here's someone who's serious. Here's someone who's sober about the responsibility that they've been asked to do. And then he begins to say this, then not double-tongued. 
he says what he means, means what he says. I think the Lord says it best. That your yes be yes and your no be no. Double tongue is not double minded. Double tongue is not okay. When I'm, when I'm with you, I say one thing. When I'm with you, I say another thing. Double tongue is, there's a consistency in my message and, and you can depend upon my word. What I tell you is my word. What I tell you is my word. And my word is going to be as con- connected as it can be, continuous as it can be. Here's someone who doesn't go behind somebody's back and malign them. Here's someone who up front has the courage to be truthful and a person of integrity. And when they say yes, they mean yes. They don't say King's X. They don't say by God. Their yes is yes because they understand all yes and all no is before God. And so the idea of double tongue has to do with someone who represents integrity and represents the truth And when they tell you about something that you can trust their word. When they tell you about the word of God, you can trust their word. Would you want to ask someone to do something for this church who's got a reputation of being dishonest because you can't trust what they say? That someone's been bit by them, someone's been hurt by them, someone has been skewered by them? No, you want someone... Who understands their word has power, their word has meaning because their word represents their place before God. So he says, not someone double-tongued. And then he says, not given to much wine. The real emphasis here is with regard to the excess. Someone who labors long at the wine. It's someone who has given their life to laboring long at it. And with regard to the constitution of their wine, they would have had to have labored long at it to become intoxicated. There's nothing like what we have on the market today. But here's someone who has a discipline about themselves. And the Lord expects of this man, he expects of elders, and he expects of Christians to be sober. We want to talk about drunk or not drunk. No, it's sober or not sober. That's the question. It's not a qualification of what's drunk. The question is, is a person who engages in the use of wine, little or or much, is that person sober? That's what he wants. So it says, well, the deacon, elder can't use any wine, but the deacon could use a little because it says not given to much. Okay. So, I'm going to tell you, don't be given to much lying. That means a little lying is okay, right? Don't be given to much adultery, because that means a little adultery is okay, right? No, we understand that, don't we? He's not giving a qualification about some small amount. He's using their language to tell them, I don't want someone who labors long to become intoxicated, and that's their longing. This idea of given to it, given to it, is the same idea of lust. It's the same idea of lust that has to do with covetousness, has to do with Matthew chapter 5, that the heart of adultery of someone that tries to possess what they have no right to possess. And here's this person that is going to possess that which is going to disable them from being a sober, serious-minded person when they need to be. And so he says, not given too much wine. Then he says, not greedy. You don't want someone whose primary motive in life and primary responsibility in life is how much money can I collect? How, how big can I make my bank account? How, how full can, how much, how much can, I, can I leave to my kids? What can I have? And so you, you, kind of like the old Dr. Scrooge, you're just gonna have, you're gonna gather everything you can and everybody else is just gonna have to root hog or die poor on their own. You don't want someone who is going to be a greedy person. You want someone who is going to be cheerful and a cheerful giver. Someone who is going to be a giver of themselves and a giver of whatever the need is. But this would really be important. If one of the responsibilities a church asks a man to do on their behalf is going to be taking care of the funds that have been collected into a common fund. You wouldn't want a Judas. Remember him? He was the keeper of the apostles' treasury, but he was also dipping into the apostles' treasury and then betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You want someone who you can trust, 
When you have entrusted the collective fund that this local church has to do the Lord's work. You don't want somebody that's greedy. You want someone who has a love of people, not a love of money. And their pursuit is people, their pursuit is not money. Now, codicil, amendment. If as a result of their honest and genuine labor, that God blesses them with, with financial ability and financial success, that doesn't mean the person's greedy. That doesn't mean that driving that person is only for money. It means that person has applied themselves well to the task that God has put before them and blessed them. And now they take that and they use it for others. But you can tell they're honest because they built bigger barns and built bigger barns, but they've done it with integrity and no, pers- no, no purpose just to kind of in- increase their wealth. It's just a byproduct of their acumen and opportunities being given to them. So you're not saying here you can't be a millionaire or you can't be a billionaire or you can't have a large savings account. That's not what he's saying. He's saying here's a person whose drive, whose singular drive is, the love of money. That's it. And then he says in verse 9, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. I think that's similar to what is said in Titus chapter 1 when he talks about holding fast the word, holding fast the mystery, that word mystery of faith. So the mystery has been revealed. Holding fast the mystery of faith, holding fast the gospel, holding fast the standard of truth. Holding fast to a standard of truth. And that standard of truth is the word of God. There's a faithfulness that's been demonstrated to the word of God. And an ability to understand that word of God. And stand by and stand with and stand on the truth of God. Here's a person who holds fast. Holds fast and does it with a pure conscience. Sincere. There's no cracks. That word sincere you're probably aware of. Came from the time in which they were making pottery. And after they got done, they'd hold it up to see if the light shone through to see if there were any cracks. If there were no cracks or fissures that showed through, they would stamp it as genuine. It was sincere, sincere. But if not, then it would be destroyed because it was now, it was duplicitous. It's no, no good. It's not pure. And so you just want someone who, out of a pure conscience, a pure conscience holds, is holding the mystery of the faith of God. Not trying to use it as a a manipulative tool, but holding the word of God with a pure conscience. Sincere. Here, this person is sincere about the truth of God, and the truth of God animates them, and the truth of God is the standard of their life. Now, when you look at 1 Timothy 3, those are the things that you see. You do see a little bit later on the idea of blameless. And the idea of blameless is the same as what is said earlier. And here's someone who is without reproach, someone you can't point a finger at to say, to give an accusation. Actually, the holding the mystery of faith and the blameless are kissing cousins, especially the pure conscience part. The pure conscience and the blameless, they're, they're, they're kissing cousins because blameless looks at the, the heart of the man and looks at the behavior of the man. And there's nothing with which you can't indict his heart. Because there's nothing in his behavior that would indict that heart. Here is someone not not perfect, not sinless, but someone who's of a good reputation. And someone who sets a proper example. Now, a proper example is not mentioned in this, but it's certainly implied all the way through this. So you want the example of someone who is a blameless individual. Someone, not someone that you can cast aspersions toward and someone that you can accuse and that person be guilty. That's the first part of this. The second part of this begins in verse 11. And you have the word likewise again. And it says, likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. And so the question comes, is he now talking about the wives of deacons? Why do you talk about the wives of deacons and not talk about the wives of elders? Or are you talking about deaconesses, women who can be deacons? What's he talking about? Well, first of all, a few technical things to consider. First of all, the word there is supplied. I think that's a consideration. So there's no there, T-H-E-R-E, there. Wives is the word for women because there's no Greek word for wife. It's the word woman. If wife is mentioned, then it's put in the context of marriage, and it's understood that by the context. 
Furthermore, the word wives is the word women. It's a plural. It's the plural use of the term, not the singular use of the term. And so he talks about let women be. I don't think he's talking here about the wives of those who would be deacons. I think he's talking about women who the church would ask on their behalf, will you please serve this task for the church? Now, here's our conundrum, and here's where we're about to bid on that. So you're saying the church can apport deaconesses. Stop thinking official. Think servant. We think deacon, we think office. We think rule. So now you're saying a woman can hold an office and she can have rule in the church. No. Don't even think that with men. Think servant. That's what you had in Romans chapter 16. And verse 1, you had Phoebe who was a servant. There's our word. Of the church in Sincrea. And a help to Paul. Philippians chapter 4. You have two women that were helpers. Helpers for Paul. And the church at Philippi. Now if you're going to have something that is a job that is fit for women. We describe the job. A job that you need a woman to do that job. And let's be honest. There's some jobs that only women are really fit to do because of the nature of the job. What kind of woman would you want to ask to do that job? He says one that's reverent, we've talked about that, not slanders. That kind of goes with the idea of not double-tongued. Temperate, self-controlled, and faithful in all things. Here's the description of, of this woman or the character of these women you're going to ask to do this. If we go back to Acts chapter 6, and they chose Grecian men because of Grecian widows. Would it not also be consistent to say we ask the women to serve a woman or women to meet their need? And when that need is finished, just like Acts 6, the responsibility is finished. A couple of illustrations. Quinlina Peterson had been diagnosed with cancer, and it finally got to the point where she could no longer function well by herself. Someone had to be with her during the day. Do you think it would have been best for us to ask, so we have two deacons that are benevolent deacons that take care of our benevolence, Jim Penn and Brian Turquette. Do you think it would have been best if we asked, okay, Jim, will you go, go over Monday and will you stay with Glenna? And Brian, will you go over on Tuesday and will you all alternate days going over and take care of them? Because they are deacons. We're going to ask them to take care of one of our flock. Would that, would, that, would that have been the best thing to do in that situation for Glenna? There are just some jobs a man doesn't need to be around doing. Now, pause button. Men and women need to be careful when we allow ourselves to be put in situations that are compromising. And you certainly want, wouldn't want to ask someone to do something on behalf of the church. That would be a compromising situation. And so what happened was there was a team of women that gathered to help them. They took it on themselves to help her. They helped that. They helped her. I remember years ago when Glenna broke her arm, the two sisters, Peggy and Ann, they went and they sat with Glenna while she healed from breaking her arm. If we have a woman in this church that has a need that this church can fulfill, then it is right and proper to ask that woman who is a servant, who is reverent, not a slander, who is self-controlled, temperate, and who is faithful to help serve her. Rule of thumb. Anything the church can do and a woman can do, the church can ask a woman to do. Anything the church can do and a woman can't do, the church can't ask a woman to do. Anything a woman can do, but the church, a woman can't do in the church, the church can't ask her to do. But anything the church can do and a woman can do, the church can ask that woman to serve on behalf of that church. Well, we now just have asked deaconess, no, we're looking at the job. 
when the job's fulfilled, that area of service is fulfilled. In other areas, there are ongoing jobs that take place. There are ongoing responsibilities because the job's never fulfilled. And so he's talking about the kind of woman or women you want to serve. Now let me add something else to this real quick. If it is your conviction, you think he's talking about the wives of deacons, that's fine. Please don't fall out with me about that. I'm not going to fall out with you. But here's what I would say. If this is a description of the kind of woman or women the church would ask to serve as servants for the need of a woman, would this description not also be consistent to ask of the wife of a man who would serve as a deacon? And would, this, would it not also be consistent to ask that this be the description of a wife of a man who would serve as an elder? And so what you have is the description of the kind of woman that you want as a servant, but that kind of woman is going to be a servant to her husband if he's a deacon. That kind of woman is going to be a servant to her husband if he's an elder. That's going to be the kind of woman she is. Is there anything in this description that is, does not fit a Christian? A woman who's a Christian. Is there anything here that does not fit the description of a woman who's a Christian? No. Is there anything with regard to deacons that we've looked at so far that does not fit the description of a Christian? No. So what we're talking about is we're talking about people who are Christians who have developed themselves to the point they can be of service with these characteristics. Being part of their life and seen by the church. But then we come down to verse 10. He says, but let them first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. The idea of testing is proven. Let them be proven. That again would be the opposite. The, that would be synonymous or harmonious or parallel to, I guess you'd say, but not a novice. Here's someone who is proven. Here's someone who is tested. Here's someone who has demonstrated They've demonstrated they're not double-tongued. They've demonstrated they're reverent. They've demonstrated they're not greedy. They've demonstrated they're not given to wine. They've demonstrated that they hold fast the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. They have demonstrated themselves as being servants. They have been proven. That's the same thing with regard to elders. You want someone who's proven. And then notice what he says. Let them first be tested. Then let them. Then let them serve as deacons. Notice what he does not say. He does not say, you can appoint them, and then they'll learn how to do it. You appoint them, you select them, and ask them to do it so they can learn how to do it. No. That's not what he says. That's common sense. What he says is common sense, right? He says, let them first be tested, then let them serve as deacons. Why? Because they have been proven and tested. That ought to be simple enough for us. Men who serve the church as deacons are men, as servants, are men who are tested. Men who are proven. They, want, they must have some maturity about them. Did you notice in Acts chapter 6, there was nothing said about a man being young? And nothing said here necessarily about a man being old? What do we normally think of when we think about deacons? Deacons are young men. Elders are old men. And so all you young men, you're going to be deacons. All you old men, if you're not an elder, sorry, you're out. No, old men, not young, young or old is not the qualification here. The qualification is you want someone who is this. You want someone who is proven. You want someone who is blameless. And then he talks about in verse 13, having served well as deacons, obtained for themselves a good standing. That goes back to good reputation. Have obtained for themselves a good standing. And a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Here's this person who has demonstrated their servant and they have good standing and they've been bold with their faith in Christ. They're not timid or ashamed of it. They're not in your face. They're not pointing their finger in your face. But here's someone who is bold, who's confident and strong with the mystery of, of God's word, with the mystery of the truth. As they have a pure conscience and they have a good standing with people and a good standing with God. And so when you describe this man, 
That's the description, but understand, this also is a stewardship. And the one to whom one answers to as a deacon with regard to the kind of man they're going to be is going to be the Lord. Because the man who serves well will have a great reward with the Lord. We're going to come back next week and we're going to look at verse 11. I'm sorry, verse, verse 12. And then close this out. I close with this like I did every, every time with the, with the men who are, we select, try to select, select as elders. Can you find this man? When we describe the job that needs to be done, can you find this kind of man to do that kind of job? I think you probably can. Well, we've not talked about things relative to salvation this morning. We certainly want to ask and give you the opportunity, if you need to come to Christ for the salvation of your sins, that you and your study or someone studying with you, you come to the conviction of mind that you're lost, and you're asking the question, what must I do to be saved? And you want to come and be baptized because you have changed your mind about God and changed your mind about sin. You have put in place repentance and set that as an anchor point of crucifying the old man. And now you want to come and have that old man buried to be raised anew. If we can help you do that, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.